lot of complicated biochemistry purifying the inside, etc. And sure enough, we proved that it did in fact activate the soluble isoform of guanine cyclase, and it was very, very potent as a molecule. I think we realized the importance of the field at the time. This is what a nitrified vasodilator will do to a blood vessel segment. It causes relaxation and elevates cyclic GMP. And we put this story together in a review article about 1978. <coughs> it said, we figured out how nitrovasodilators, such as nitroglycerin, work. They're prodrugs to make nitric oxide, and that's what causes relaxation. Now, as a farm, you know, I wear lots of hats. You know, there are times when I'm an administrator, times I am a doctor, times I'm a biochemist or a pharmacologist. But as a pharmacologist, I've learned that when you have a pathway that's regulated by an extraneous outside molecule, you should wonder if that's mimicking an endogenous pathway that might be important. Let me give you an example. The narcotics, the opiates, led to this search for molecules that mimic their effect in the brain. Sure enough, the enkephalins came along as a new family of mediators. But there are many other examples in science where this has happened. So I wondered if nitric oxide could be mediating the effects of various hormones in the body and that there was a way to make them in the body somehow. And that's how hormones were working. And I proposed this in 1978. Well, again, it was impossible to prove it. It took another seven or eight years of work by us. But then finally other laboratories got interested and sure enough, the hypothesis was true. So we predicted all of this a decade before other laboratories. Our first publications with the biological effects of nitric oxide were in 1977. Today, in 2011, if you go to PubMed, you'll probably find 130,000 publications in this field. It's become one of the most popular areas in all biology. And that's because it has so many interesting effects, as I'll try to summarize for you. About 1980, you heard the name Robert Furchkow, who I shared the prize with. <coughs> he was a vascular pharmacologist at State University of New York in Brooklyn, and I knew him from my stays as a student. He discovered that some drugs that were known to lower blood pressure in man and animals had always failed to cause relaxation of blood vessel segments in the organ bath in the laboratory. They never worked. These were acetylcholine, histamine, bradykine, and a long list. And one day he accidentally found, and most scientific discoveries are accidents, but you've got to have a curious mind and you got to trust your data to realize that it's true. And chase it. And he did. His technician one day, instead of making segments of blood vessels, chopped them off like sausages. And when he did that, the endothelium was intact. He didn't destroy the endothelium like he did when he dissected the blood vessels. And then the, these substances caused relaxation. He called them endothelial-dependent vasodilators. They required the integrity of the endothelium. And the endothelium released a substance into the medium that he called endothelial-derived relaxant factor, EDRF. In the spring of 1980, he came to Virginia and gave a lecture. I heard his lecture before his publication in Nature in the summer of 1980. And I was very excited about his findings. It turned out that EDRF had a very short half-life, it was very reactive, and had a lot of the features and properties of nitric oxide. So I took him off to my office for about an hour and we talked about how it might be working. And I suggested to him that EDRF must be working through cyclic AMP or cyclic GMP. And maybe it was a nitric oxide-like substance. And we were going to collaborate to find out. Well, his wife was with him in that visit to Charlottesville. My wife took his wife to Monticello. She tripped on the steps, broke her leg. 
The x-ray showed that she had metastatic cancer in her leg, breast cancer. So Bob was very upset, distraught. He went back to New York, concentrated on taking care of his wife. A few months later, we moved to Stanford, and our collaboration never happened. <coughs> a few months later, one of the faculty in Virginia came to visit. We were consulting for Syntex, which was across the street from my laboratories. And he said, what are you doing with EDRF? And I said, we're waiting for samples from French guy. Let me bring the fellow in. And I said, Bob, are we getting samples? He said, no, we haven't gotten any. And then he smiled. I said, what are you doing, Robert? <laughs> he said, I'm squirreling away samples in the freezer. He had done the experiment, but he hadn't assayed them. <laughs> so I said, you're going to go back and assay them to find out what the answer tomorrow. And sure enough, tomorrow we discovered that EDRF worked in cycle with you. That was the discovery. I then thought that EDRF was a nitric oxide complex or adduct. Other people proposed that it was nitric oxide. There's been a lot of controversy as to what it is. I think it's a variety of substances that relax smooth muscle. Nitric oxide, nitric oxide complexes and adducts. And probably other molecules as well. And because the concentrations are so low, we don't have the technology to determine what precisely is EDRF. But it doesn't matter. Because, in fact, there are enzymes in the blood vessel, in the endothelium, that make nitric oxide. And let me continue that on the story. This is a cartoon of a blood vessel <coughs> showing the endothelial lining and the underlying smooth muscle in the wall of the blood vessel. In red, there are three categories of vasodilators that relax blood vessels. On the right upper corner are the nitrovasodilators, like nitroglycerin, that are converted to nitric oxide. They're converted in the bloodstream or they're converted inside of the cell. Some require enzymes to do it. The nitric oxide activates the soluble isoformic water light cells. <coughs> I won't go into the detailed biochemistry. We've done a lot of spectroscopy expression in the enzyme to figure this all out. We probably made, oh my god, 100 milligrams of enzyme trying to do that uh, aspect and uh, figure out precisely how things are happening. Uh, but the enzyme's activated to make cyclic GMP, which then activates a protein kinase. The protein kinase phosphorylates a variety of proteins that we examined in blood vessels. And some of these proteins participate in the regulation of intracellular calcium. They prevent calcium coming through the membrane, or they redistribute calcium inside of the cell. And when you lower the calcium, you inhibit the activity of an enzyme that's very important for muscle contraction, myosin light chain kinase. That enzyme will phosphorylate myosin light chain. And when myosin light chain is phosphorylated, the actin myosin filaments slide together to latch and get contraction. When you dephosphorylate the myosin light chain, they slide apart to your relaxation. So if you inhibit the activity of myosin light chain kinase, the myosin is primarily in the dephosphorylated state. That's the mechanism for relaxation. It took us a few years to figure this all out. This wasn't done overnight. A lot of people, my goodness, I think over the course of a couple of years, we worked with one Curie of P32. A lot of P32. <laughs> a lot of plastic shields. Uh, and then we went back to examine EDRF with Furchgott and learned that the endothelial cells also made nitric oxide, EDRF. And that would move over to the smooth muscle compartment and it worked exactly like the nitrovasodilators. The biochemistry was identical. Well, it turns out the endothelial cell has an enzyme called nitric oxide synthase that makes nitric oxide. These were some important contributions from Salt Lake in Japan. I'm going to skip through some of them. It turns out there are three isoforms of nitric oxide synthase. Initially, they were called neuronal nitric oxide synthase 